how to get to our store. Can you see all that? It's like part of it's off the screen there. Well, it's store.apologeticspress.org is what it is. Store.apologeticspress.org. <clears throat> and so this is where you can get other things that you might um, want to get. So, so if you go to the search engine here and plug in, you would want it God and government. Uh, that's this one right here. All right, so real easy to get around on this store, so you can check that out there. All right. Okie doke. We're nearing the end. Everybody's energy level holding out? Yeah, all right, that's good. <clears throat> okay, so the final, <clears throat> the, you know, there's other things that I could talk about with regard to evolution's alleged evidence. I'm trying to hit the things that I think are the, are the big ones that you'll tend to see, but there's some other obscure ones that you might not see as much that I do deal with um, in my Bear Valley class, I do anyway. Um, I'm writing the book that will go through this stuff, um, but it hasn't, I haven't had time to finish it yet. Uh, remember that each one of those evidences we've looked at, you could, you could categorize them as either erroneous, they're totally now, now recognized to be false, they're irrelevant, remember, if they have nothing really to do with um, macro evolution, but instead have to do with micro evolution, because Darwin argued that every, all the species could be explained <clears throat> through his form of evolution. That's not micro, that's macro. And so a lot of times the evidences that are brought up are, are evidence of micro, not macro. So that makes them irrelevant to this whole debate. Or they're inadequate, meaning that they, they would be supportive of evolution, they don't contradict it, but that those same evidences are inadequate because they could be explained in a totally different way. So I'd put homologous structures there, for example, in that one. All right, now the last big one that I wanted to cover is this idea of dating methods, okay? Because if evolution is true, you need a long period of time. And so um, at the same time that Darwin's idea was taking off, uh, you know, I think that the way that it worked out, you know, the devil's kind of sneaky. He gave them a geological evolution concept right around the same time. So you had biological evolution, and then the geology side came out at around the same time, allowing for an old earth to allow their time to be evolution. Uh, and so I want to look then at <clears throat> that idea of the supposed evidences that are given for an old earth. So let's look at these. According to evolutionists, the scientific dating methods prove that the earth is very old. So is that true? The problems with evolutionary dating methods come down to, once again, assumptions. The assumptions of every single one of these evolutionary dating methods. And I'm not against assumptions, uh, necessarily. Uh, we make assumptions all the time in science and mathematics. It's really not, a, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Assumptions can be fine and good as long as the assumptions are reasonable and have a small enough effect on the outcome of the problem so that it doesn't drastically affect the outcome based on that assumption. So look, for example, let's go ahead and look at a specific example. Uh, this is actually from engineering, a real world example from engineering. And um, so let's say for example that I wanted to design a vehicle that I wanted to use on just a one mile strip of road, straight strip of road, absolutely nobody, it's deserted, nobody's using this, and I've blocked it off for my use and maintained this road very well where it's repaved, and I put fences up to keep the animals off of this road, and so I, I, you know, I've tried to take everything into account to make sure this road is clear and smooth. Now let's say that <clears throat> I wanna design this vehicle so that I can remotely control it 
from here at this, this building, even though it's going to be way off somewhere that's going to be happening. And so I equip it with the necessary sensors so that I know what its velocity and heading is at all times. I don't want to count on a camera being on there. I'm going to do all of this without any of that. I'm just going to be using these sensor readings. And so I start developing the equations that will describe the motion of that car. And one of, the, one of the issues with those kind of equations is it gets really, this is calculus, and it gets really complicated when there's the possibility that your car will start skidding to the right or left, where you start having uh, a horizontal component like that in your equations. And so I make the assumption that I'm not going to have that with those conditions. And so I check the weather conditions and I don't see there's skidding is unlikely and this is just a mile strip of road. I'm, so my car is probably not going to start skidding in that way. And so that actually is a reasonable assumption. That's not going to cause a significant amount of error in my equations. We do that all the time. Uh, my doctoral work, that kind of thing was done a lot in our laboratories, not a big deal. Now let's say though that I design the same car with the same off-road use assumption uh, where this car is out in the middle of nowhere with no road and I want to control the car from here and I assume now there's 100% traction where you don't have any hors uh, I'm assuming there's no horizontal component there. Now how likely is it that I'm going to know exactly where my car is at the end of one mile strip of road? Uh, well, if you know much about this, you would know that that is not likely. I could be way off by the end. <clears throat> so assumptions have to be made in science, but those assumptions have to be made very carefully or your end results will be way off. So invalid assumptions can cause you to draw conclusions that are totally not warranted by the actual evidence. Now, the problem with the evolutionary dating methods are that they are based on unreasonable assumptions. And the main one is this idea of uniformitarianism. Every single dating method I've ever seen that is used to try to prove an old earth or an old universe comes down to this principle as one of the underlying assumptions. And it was James Hutton that suggested the idea that the present is the key to the past in geology. The concept that the present is the key to the past, the principle that contemporary geologic processes, the things going on today in geology, have occurred in the same regular manner and with essentially the same intensity throughout geologic time. And the events of the geologic past can be explained by phenomena observable today. So whatever we see going on today, you assume it's always been that way throughout time. So if you don't see a global flood happening today, then that, you assume that never happened. You don't see creation going on today, so you assume that never happened. So you assume things have always gone on in the same way we see today. You can't have catastrophic things going on. So this is fundamental to all of these dating methods. Now the question is, is it a reasonable assumption? Is uniformitarianism reasonable? And the answer is no. We can, there's so much we could talk about on this subject. Let's just give you a few examples that show the silliness of this when you go out and, and actually get empirical data. For example, geologists say that water from 41% of the nation drains down into the Mississippi River Delta. And as the Mississippi River is rolling along down towards the Gulf of Mexico, it picks up dirt and sediment along the way. And over thousands of years, the Mississippi River has been dumping water and sediment along the Louisiana coastline. And and they say approximately 500 million tons of sediment gets dumped into the Gulf of Mexico by the Mississippi River every year. Okay, well, let's do the math and assume uniformitarianism. Today's processes have always gone on in the same way in the past with the same intensity. So if the earth has been around as long as they claim it has, then the Gulf of Mexico would have long been completely filled with dirt and sediment, wouldn't it? So common sense tells you that. This is not a reasonable assumption. The present isn't the key to the past in geology. So what they'd have to say is, well, the Mississippi River hasn't been doing the same thing it's doing now throughout time. Okay, I agree, but that's not uniformitarianism. You've now given up that assumption. That's the problem with all these dating methods. The way they fix these anomalies is to throw uniformitarian out, uniformitarianism out in that case. The problem is the minute you drop uniformitarianism, you now have dropped your evidence of an old earth because they're all based on that. 
In the words of one of the leading creation geologists, Andrew Snelling, uh, that I talked about earlier, he said, the present isn't the key to the past. The past is actually the key to the present. You've got to understand what happened in the past to make sense of the present from a creation perspective. Catastrophism is the geologic assumption we would subscribe to. Most features in the earth were produced by the occurrence of sudden, short-lived worldwide events, right? Stuff that don't happen today, like global flood. And this actually is more reasonable, and this is what we would argue. So notice, for example, what 2 Peter 3 says. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last day. I was talking about that earlier. Walking according to their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. There's your uniformitarianism. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. So Peter describes these individuals who would have a uniformitarian mindset towards life that all things continue as they were from the beginning. And notice that he responds by pressing the fact that things haven't always moved along in the same way from the beginning. Present events are not a key to the past, as uniformitarianism suggests. So if using uniformitarian thinking when viewing life and the earth is not going to give you accurate results because it doesn't take into account things that have happened but which don't happen regularly, like catastrophic events. And notice that as an example of why uniformitarian thinking isn't accurate, Peter alludes to the greatest catastrophic event ever recorded in history, the global flood of Noah. Now granted, the implications of the catastrophic approach to interpreting geology is that there is no way to get an accurate uh, date for anything that's very old except through divine revelation. But so be it. I mean, if that's where the evidence leads, then that's where it leads, and it would be unreasonable to accept any other option not in harmony with the evidence. Now, on a positive note, some scientists are acknowledging uniformitarianism is not a good uh, model to stick to because they argue actually for more catastrophism than we do. When you look at the fossil record, I wish I had, a, had my chart for this to show you, but when you look at the fossil record, they argue that there were, there were five mega extinction events in the history of the, of the earth that wiped out huge percentages of the earth's uh, life. Five. We argue for one. Okay. So they're more catastrophic than we are. They don't even know what these events were. I mean, we would interpret the same data differently. We could talk, again, that's more creation uh, seminar type thing, but the point I'm making is they, they argue for at least five, and only one of them do they have an idea about, and they think maybe it was the meteorite that struck, and they think that wiped out the dinosaurs, but that is not a uniformitarian uh, event. That's catastrophic. It's thought to have wiped out 70 to 75 percent of the planet's species. That's, that's no uniform process. That doesn't happen today. So, again, some scientists are starting to move out of this strict uniformitarian thinking, which is great, but they haven't seemed to realize that that means you have to give up on the old earth position. But here's some of what's forcing them to realize uniformitarianism may not be right. When they look at what happens in volcanic eruptions, it will cause some serious doubt in the minds over this idea of strict uniformitarianism. So, for example, it's long been believed that the Grand Canyon Okay, when you look at the Grand Canyon, see the Colorado River moving through there, and you're thinking uniformitarianism. So whatever is happening today has always happened. So today, if the Colorado River has been moving through there, eroding it, then it must have always done that. And so it's been do it must have been doing it for 70 million years is what they'll argue. So it's been assumed that that's what it's been doing, rolling along, doing that as it does for millions of years, according to uniformitarian thinking. Now, the problem is on March 19, 1982, there was a small eruption at the summit of Mount St. Helens and it caused a massive mud flow that within one day, a 20 mile long, 140 foot deep canyon was carved. So this completely nullifies uniformitarianism. If, if uniformitarianism is true, then when you look at that little creek going through this canyon, it should have taken tens if not hundreds of thousands of years for that canyon to form. And yet we know it was one day. And it's been called the Little Grand Canyon because it appears to be a 140th scale model of the Grand Canyon. 
<clears throat> the Lake Missoula flood is a well-documented flood from, uh, they would even agree, the Ice Age, we would say the post-flood Ice Age. Water breached an ice dam at that time and 500 cubic miles of water were released. That's 10 times the combined flow of all of the rivers in the world. And it was released in two days. The result was that it, it destroyed 16,000 square miles of terrain, cut hundreds of feet through solid rock, created canyons, carved 50 cubic miles of earth. Here's another example of rapid erosion. This one actually at Grand Canyon, specifically in Glen Canyon uh, in uh, June 1983, heavy snowfall caused engineers to uh, <clears throat> push the limits of the power plant located there and they pushed huge amounts of water through these dam spillways, and it, and it um, ultimately caused three-foot-thick steel-reinforced concrete, the lining of this tunnel, to be torn out, penetrated with pits. It, chunks of concrete were torn out. It took tens of thousands of cubic feet of concrete to refill these pits that had been created just from water rushing through there. So bottom line is that whenever you have catastrophic conditions, it significantly uh, increases how quickly things that you might think are old, uh, how quickly those things can form. So definitely that's the case with regard to canyons. And Grand Canyon is believed by creation scientists to have been formed in that way. During the Ice Age period, uh, I got to go down and study that by raft and look at a lot of those evidences. And again, I could do almost a whole session just on that topic as well. Rapid petrification, here's another example. <clears throat> it's long been assumed that petrification takes a long time, millions of years. But again, more and more scientific evidence is coming to light that proves that the rate of petrification is significantly altered, again, when you have catastrophic conditions. So just as one example of many that we could site. In uh, 2004, five Japanese scientists published their research on rapid petrification in the secular journal Sedimentary Geology. They were studying some mineral-rich acidic water from the explosion crater of the Tatayama volcano in central Japan. And water, you see there, runs over the edge of that volcano as a waterfall. And they found some wood that had fallen in the path of that mineral-rich water and they saw that it had petrified, they knew within 36 years. And so they decided to conduct further tests and found um, by putting uh, wood into this kind of water that it petrified that wood uh, through sil uh, silica petrification in only seven years. Uh, also in 2004, a paper was published on the rapid silicification of plants at Yellowstone. And they found within only 11 months, plants were found to have already had enough solidification that the plant tissues had been stabilized against collapse and the plant structure was replicated. Other proofs of catastrophism that showed uniformitarianism isn't right, polystrate fossils, so these are fossils that cut across multiple strata, mo multiple layers, like this tree <clears throat> or this tree. So if those layers around these trees took millions of years for that material to be deposited and then to lithify, then what are you having to argue there? You're having to say that you have this tree sticking up out of the ground, the bottom part of it, it's somehow staying alive for millions of years. Does that happen? No. It's, what's going to happen to the tree? Well, it's going to rot, it's going to fall down and ultimately decay unless all of those layers are formed rapidly, like this, that this tree was buried in some kind of catastrophic event, like a big mudslide that, that buries this whole thing at once, that all of these layers are not being deposited slowly. So we find trees, but also calamites, which are these fragile little uh, pre-flood um, uh, plants. Also catfish have been uncovered. This is a baleen whale that's been discovered <coughs> in polystrate type conditions. This one found in a diatomaceous earth quarry in California. So just one example of a polystrate fossil refutes the idea that sediments take millions of years to be deposited and lithify. We've got dinosaur graveyards all over the world. 
where you've got um, thousands of dinosaur fossils that have been, um, that are found in one place. So some kind of event that kills and uh, drowns and in some cases tears apart thousands of dinosaurs, carries them long distances, long enough to organize the fossils based on gravity where the heavier fossils are at the bottom and then they get smaller as they go up. So one massive event that kills and wipes these out. I was studying uh, the, uh, this dinosaur fossil bed out in Wyoming where you have uh, over 20,000 dinosaur fossils from 5,000 uh, different animals. And they're all in this one massive ranch. They're all deposited there. Uh, huge amounts of, and these, these dinosaurs were obliterated. They're in, in little pieces by the catastrophic conditions that killed them, we would say at the end of the flood. <clears throat> You got something catastrophic going on here. You find a lot of fossils where these are called aspiration fossils, where it looks like the fish is like in the middle of <clears throat> eating its meal whenever something catastrophic kills it. How about this one? Can you tell what, this is an ichthyosaur. Anybody tell what is going on as this creature gets killed and buried? Anybody? I'm just curious, anybody know? Can you tell what's coming out here? That's a baby coming out there. This is one of the reasons we know that ichthyosaurs gave live birth. So it's in the middle of giving birth when it gets killed. Uh, these dinosaurs, usually when you find dinosaur fossils, they're disarticulated. That means you, you find their bones separate uh, you don't find them in their position that they, they would have been in while the animal was alive. They're, they're in bits and pieces. But if you happen to find one where the dinosaur is articulated like this, all the bones in place, you'll often find them if they have a, a structure like this, their necks pulled back, their tails curved forward, their mouth a lot of times is open as though they're gasping for breath. And this is a, 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 a known as a death pose, the epistatonic Death posture is what it's called. And it's understood to be due to likely death by drowning. Uh, this is a catastrophically buried uh, clam bed we looked at in Wyoming. Clams, whenever they die in a natural condition, a uniform condition, they, the clams open up. If you find them buried uh, closed, it, it would indicate rapid burial. That's not something that happens in a normal conditions. So bottom line is, is, I mean, there's so much more we can say about this, that ca catastrophes happen, and when they happen, they make things happen fast. The uniformitarianism would assume takes a long time. And again, thankfully, many geologists <clears throat> are coming around on that. I was reading a, a, a geology, a college geology textbook a few years ago, and, and right out at the beginning, they're talking about Catastrophism, and oh, people used to believe in catastrophism. We don't believe in that hokiness anymore. And they said, then we believe in uniformitarianism. Well, we think that's wrong now, too. And so they said, now we kind of believe in a hybrid of the two. <laughs> so they, they, they kind of believe some in catastrophism. Again, what I would say is they actually believe more in catastrophism than we do. In fact, I, I theorize that eventually they're going to come around to acknowledging there was a global flood. That's my guess. But then they'll say, oh, it doesn't prove the Bible. <laughs> That's what they'll say. They'll say, well, you know, the Bible just, you know, took that legend because there really was a global flood. That doesn't mean it was inspired by God. That's what they'll do. But I figure at some point they're going to have to acknowledge we're right about this. But anyway, if uniformitarianism is false, then all dating methods are false because they rely on that. The assumption that starlight proves that the earth or the universe is billions of years old, that's assuming constant uh, transport of light in a natural way. Uh, when you look at ice cores and the layers in ice cores or uh, lake varves at the bottom of a lake, again, they're assuming uniform deposit of these things. Uh, every method, again, that I've ever, I've ever seen assumes normal conditions like we see today, and they don't take into account the effects of catastrophic conditions. <clears throat> But once the, the assumption of uniformitarianism is shown to be wrong, then again, they lose all of this evidence. But let's go ahead and look at some of the specifics. You got 
you've got a couple different ways of, of dating things. There are what we call um, um, relative dating methods. That's where they don't give you an actual specific age. They just say, this has to be older than this. Like, for example, in geology, you have, the, you have a principle, a superposition principle, where if you have a rock layer down here and one above it, well, you assume that if, there, if there's no evidence that they've been flipped, that this one had to have been deposited before this one, right? So this one is older than this one because the only way for this to be on top of this one is if that one existed first, right? Now, that doesn't tell you how much older, but this is a relative. They're not telling you relatively how old it is. They're telling you how old something is relative to the other, if that makes sense. One's older than the other. There's generally not a problem with that, with, the, with that kind of dating. The problem comes in what are called the absolute dating methods, where they try to give a specific age to something. <clears throat> and so let's go ahead and look at those, the, specifically the radiometric dating methods. These are the ones where they claim to have direct evidence <clears throat> that, the, that the rocks are hundreds of millions to billions of years old. Second law of thermodynamics, we talked about that some last night. The universe is running down. We're running out of usable energy. Uh, things are breaking down. We see that radioactive isotopes decay uh, into other elements over time, and that breakdown appears to be at constant rates today. There's your uniformitarian idea. And so we see potassium breaking down to argon, uranium into lead, rubidium into strontium, and the starting element we call the parent element and it decays into your daughter element, and they're able to measure the rate at which the parent isotopes decay into the daughter isotopes with an amazing degree of accuracy. The problem is any time they try to use <clears throat> more than one method on the same rock, they differ from each other, generally by millions of years. Uh, and because, like, let's say you have a, a rock that has potassium and argon and uranium and lead in it, okay? So you can actually use two methods on that particular rock. When they use the two methods, the dates never agree with each other. And so they usually will only use one method because it's so expensive to do this. But they'll assume in that case, well, there just must be, you know, one of the assumptions hasn't been met or something. They throw it out like it's no big deal. But the bottom line is they know these don't, they don't match and they know that it comes down to the assumptions. Okay, and again, I'm not, I don't have a problem with assumptions in general, but we have to be careful with them. So take, for example, the uranium lead dating method. Uranium decays down into lead over time. What are the assumptions that go into getting an age for a piece of uranium? All right, the first big one is that uniformitarianism, the nuclear decay rates of the elements have been constant throughout history. In other words, Nothing occurred in history that could have sped up the decay of uranium into lead for some period of time. All right, number two, they assume that no daughter element existed in the specimen being measured at the beginning of its decay. So they assume it originally was completely uranium. All right, so you're making an assumption about the initial condition of the rock. And number three, the amount of parent and daughter isotopes have not been altered by anything except radioactive decay. So you're assuming a closed system, all right? So nothing's come and added uranium or lead or taken some away that would um, corrupt the accuracy of your measurement. Now, already probably common sense tells you these are some pretty grandiose, presumptuous assumptions when you're thinking a rock is millions of years old. Really? And the older a rock is thought to be, the more likely it is those assumptions have been viola uh, violated. So let's think through how reasonable this is using a simple example. So imagine for a moment you're walking down the sidewalk and in front of you, you see a pail of water on the sidewalk. It's halfway filled and you notice water around the base of the pail. You look a little bit closer and along the base of the bucket, you notice there's a small crack in it causing a slow leak. And so you decide to do an experiment and determine if you can figure out when this pail was originally filled with water and how long it's gonna take for the pail to be empty. And so you take out your trusty ruler and you measure how many inches of water in the pail and you see we got six inches. 
And so you continue your walk, and on the way back home, 30 minutes later, you stop and measure the water again, and now we're down to five and a half. And so you just say, okay, the pail is leaking a half inch every 30 minutes, that's one inch every hour, and you measure the total height of the pail, and you see it's 12 inches, and so you do the math, and you're feeling pretty smart and pretty proud of yourself and scientific, and, and you realize this pail must have been filled with water six and a half hours ago, it's gonna be empty in about five and a half hours, right? Now there's problems with your experiment because little did you know that number one, the pail was not completely filled, first of all, when, you st when it started. It was only 10 inches deep when it was filled 10 hours ago. Number two, the bucket of water was significantly affected by an outside force. Nine hours ago, a dog came and jumped in this pail and splashed half of the water out of it leaving only a quarter of the pail filled with water, three inches of water. The force of the dog hitting that pail changed the leak rate. It made the leak bigger. And so it started leaking at a different rate. An hour ago, the dog's owner came back and filled that pail back up to six and a half inches. You arrived 30 minutes ago and began your experiment, at which time the water was six inches due to the leak. So was your experiment a valid experiment? Or did your assumptions corrupt the results of your experiment? You made some assumptions that you had no right to make. So your experiment was basically worthless. Radiometric dating methods fall victim to these same fallacies. All three of these assumptions have been empirically shown to be terrible assumptions for the same sorts of reasons. So for example, the first assumption, this is the equivalent to saying that the crack at the bottom of that pail remained the same size, even though the dog's activity actually caused the crack to expand. So is it reasonable to conclude that uniformitarianism is correct about these nuclear decay rates, that the nuclear decay rates have been constant throughout history? Well, until relatively recently, the answer was yes, because scientists had tested these decay rates under a myriad of conditions and found that the decay rates appear to be constant. But now that's having to be reconsidered. Here's a couple examples of why. For example, there was a team of geologists known as the Rate Team, and they conducted extensive and notable research on this very idea. They were trying to study whether or not these decay rates have been constant throughout history, and they studied several zircon crystals from a drilling site in New Mexico. Zircons are considered to be some of the oldest minerals on the earth. They're very hard and resistant to deterioration. And they're also thought to be able to preserve their contents well, which makes them safer from contamination. So using evolutionary dating methods, the crystals were found to be one and a half billion years old. Now the problem is that when they did a content analysis of these crystals, they, it revealed large amounts of helium within these crystals. So within zircon crystals, a portion of the zirconium atoms will be replaced by uranium as it decays. Uranium-238 decays into its daughter element, lead-206, and, and alpha particles are released. They combine with nearby electrons and form helium. And so you find helium in these zircon crystals. So by evolutionary dating methods, the zircons revealed one and a half billion years of decay by just measuring the amount of parent and daughter isotopes in this rock. But the helium concentration contradicts that because helium is known to behave as a slippery material. Helium atoms are in constant motion as gas particles, so they're very hard to contain. They diffuse quickly. So you think about a helium balloon that kids have, and, and why does the helium eventually go out and, and the balloon uh, just start falling? Is the, is the helium uh, escaping through the knot? No, it's actually escaping through the rubber itself because it's really hard to contain Helium is a very slippery material like that. So here's the problem. If the crystals are as old as the dating methods suggest, uh, one and a half billion years, then there should not have been really high concentrations of helium. That should have been diffused and released into the atmosphere. So in theory, high concentrations of helium could be sustained for maybe a few thousand years without significant diffusion. Uh, the presence of high concentrations of helium illustrates the fact that at some point or points in the relatively recent past, 
the nuclear decay rate of uranium was accelerated, producing larger amounts of helium, and it hasn't yet had time to diffuse because it's happened only recently. So helium concentrations indicate a younger age. Evolutionary dating methods indicate an old age. How do you reconcile this? By understanding that dating issues are going to arise if you assume nuclear decay rates have been constant. If there are situations where the decay rates could be accelerated for periods of time, then it's going to make things look older than they actually are. Uh, in other words, rocks can be much younger than they appear to be. And of course, a global flood uh, where you have all the fountains of the great deep bursting forth, that surely is going to release. It's going to create conditions that can make these things, the nuclear decay rates, accelerate. There's also 2009, there was research announced by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, where uh, this is where the Large Hadron Collider is that discovered the God particle, the Higgs boson particle. And the research indicates that the decay rate of thorium-228, if it's in water, then it was increased by a factor of 10,000 as a result of ultrasonic cavitation. So if you have water and ultrasonic cavitation going on, those conditions, it increased the decay rate 10, by 10,000 10, times. That is a huge number, of course, and those are the very kind of conditions you would expect if the flood happened. There's the 2010 research done by a team at Purdue where they discovered that radioactive decay on Earth seems to have something to do with what's going on in the sun, uh, particularly the inner workings of the sun and how it functions. So these rates are thought to be unchangeable. The dating methods, these absolute dating methods are based on that. So the fact that they can change at all, even if it was just a small amount, is significant and it would mean that we don't really have enough information to make the assumptions that they're making. Concerning the second assumption, no daughter element was, uh, existed in the specimen when the decay began. So looking at our bu uh, water bucket illustration, this assumption is equivalent to assuming the bucket of water was initially completely filled with water. Not only was it not, but at one point uh, the owner, remember, came and put more water back in there. So in the same way, common sense should tell us you can't assume that every rock on the earth was initially completely composed of a parent element. How in the world could a person know that? Uh, how could they scientifically prove that? And how likely would that be? Parent and daughter elements from totally different sources can easily merge together in a lava flow to make one rock that has parent and daughter elements in it right when the rock begins its decay process and therefore giving it an immediate appearance of age. And sure enough, we know that, that it happens today. Uh, we've tested this and seen that that is the case, that this happens. How is it tested? Well, we have rocks today forming, from example, from volcanic eruptions. And we know exactly when the volcanoes erupted, uh, and therefore we know exactly how these particular rocks, how old they are, and yet whenever we date them, we find out that they'll be millions of years old, even though we know they're just hundreds of years old. Uh, the book, The Young Earth, uh, that we sell, uh, it's actually an Institute for Creation Research book, documents a lot of evidence for that. So why is that happening? Well, again, because the dating methods assume a rock was initially completely composed of the parent element, and many times it simply wasn't. Again, when you consider the implications of a global flood, then that gives you the perfect circumstances where this assumption would not have been uh, held either. Now, another factor, of course, that they wouldn't even consider is that rocks could have been initially created already comprised of our number of elements, not just all parent elements. If so, then many things would immediately have had the appearance of age the moment they were created. Someone says, yeah, but why would God create something with the appearance of age if it wasn't actually old? I mean, wouldn't that be deceptive for God to do that? Well, you might be able to make that argument if he didn't turn around and tell you exactly what he did, <laughs> which he did do. Uh, but then on top of that, um, you know, you would have to also be assuming that God would have done that to be deceptive, as though there wasn't another potential use for the parent and daughter elements. 
So to claim that the rock was initially completely composed of the parent element is quite an assumption. From a biblical perspective, we know God had to initially create the earth to be mature. It had to be fully functional in order for it to be fit for human beings. So light from stars that are billions of light years away had to already be in place in order for it to be used, Genesis 1.14, for humans to, to use for signs, seasons, days, and years. Adam would have been created with an immediate appearance of being grown. The first day he was created, he wasn't a zygote or something. He's able to tend the garden. He's able to have dominion over the earth, Genesis 128. He's able to understand God prohibiting eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He's able to reproduce as God commanded him to do. He's able to name the animals, so he's carrying out biology. Uh, so all of these abilities, in spite of the fact that he had just been created, trees, would have already been grown and bearing fruit. Why? Because Adam and Eve needed to eat from the trees in order to have the nourishment to sustain their life. So those trees would have likely had tree rings in them in order to be able to support the size of the mature trees because rings help to provide strength as the tree gets bigger. And so you would expect some of our oldest trees, especially petrified trees, may have actually had tree rings that God himself put in those trees and the initial trees that were made. Daughter elements also could have been present in rocks because the daughter elements serve purposes on the earth other than showing age. So caution has to be used when making any assumption about initial conditions in the decay process. The third assumption, the item being dated has never been altered. The, the amount of material has never been altered by anything except radioactive decay. In other words, this assumption is you have a closed system. This was the equivalent to saying that that pail of water was never affected by anything other than the, the small crack at the bottom of the pail, uh, rather than realizing a dog came and jumped in here. All right, so again, is this assumption reasonable? And the answer is no way. I mean, to assume that, a, that the rock you're dating has never been affected by outside forces throughout its entire existence, there wasn't ever any water or substance that soaked into a specimen, carried off an element or added to it, contaminating it. Migration of elements is common today and is known to severely affect this assumption, regardless of the care that we take in trying to select specimens for dating. Leaching is especially known to occur in lead and uranium very easily, and yet the uranium lead method is the prominent method that's used. And so again, natural ca catastrophes would certainly affect this assumption, and those kind of catastrophes are not even uncommon today, much less on the, the kind of catastrophe on the scale of the flood. Now, without these assumptions, in place, the earth cannot be dated scientifically. And that bothers many scientists. And so they just ignore the issues and just do the best they can and especially ignore them because they help with their model. They help provide the kind of evidence they need to allow for things like evolution to occur. But these assumptions totally destroy any attempt to date materials that are very old because those assumptions simply can't logically hold. It's simply irrational and unscientific to ignore these issues. The truth is there has been such catastrophic events over the years that it makes it impossible to use these techniques to date the earth. The only way to get the age for anything on the earth is ultimately going to be through divine revelation <clears throat> on these older things. Now what about specifically carbon dating? Uh, first of all, understand that carbon dating, if somebody comes up to you and says, Ah, C14 dating, carbon dating proves the earth's millions of years old. You immediately know that person doesn't, doesn't know what carbon dating is. You just mark it down. They're ignorant about what this method is because even the evolutionists that, that understand this technique will not use this for that because it only works with organic materials like trees and bones, things that contain carbon. Uh, rocks and fossils that don't have any carbon in them, they'll try to use radiometric dating methods for those, but not carbon dating. So carbon dating can't be used to try to prove the earth is millions of years old. And the reason we, we can't is because the half-life of C14 is only, we think, 5,730 years. That's just today, by the way. So if we assume constant nuclear decay, which I don't accept, but even if we go ahead and accept that, just for the sake of argument, that means that in a specimen, say you got a bone, whenever that creature dies, half of the C14 in the bone is supposed to decay into nitrogen 14 in 5,730 years. 
After another 5,730 years, another half of what's left remains. So now you're down to a quarter. Another 5,730 years, you're down to an eighth of the original carbon, and you keep doing that. After about 50,000 years, there is so little C14 left, we can no longer detect it with our technology. So you can't even use it for things that old, 50,000 years. If you detect C14 in something, you know it's not 50,000 years old. And again, that's assuming a constant nuclear decay. Now, 50,000 years is predicted to be 0.2% of the original carbon level in the, uh, in the tissue. So the dating method isn't even used for dates that are supposed to be that old, 50,000. It's generally trusted for dates that are about three to 4,000 years old. So carbon dating is not even a problem for the biblical timeline. <clears throat> Notice C14, therefore, is potentially useful in archaeology, but not in uniformitarian geology and paleontology, where they're talking millions or billions of years. But even in archaeology, they acknowledge C14 is not really to be trusted uh, hands down. It's notable they admit this. Here's what Brian Fagan of UC Santa Barbara said, carbon dating is not infallible. In general, single dates should not be trusted. <laughs> okay, and one reason is, again, comes down to bad assumptions. Besides the ones we've already looked at, C14 dating comes with other assumptions that have to do with uh, the ratio of C14 and so forth. And I'm not going to get into all that, but even with the rectifying they try to do to fix the assumptions, they rely on other dating methods that have their own assumptions. And so it's very... Uh, bottom line is carbon dating cannot be used to prove an old earth. These, none of these dating methods can because they're based on these, this assumption of uniformitarianism and other bad assumptions. Uniformitarianism is fundamentally flawed. There's no reason to reject a straightforward understanding of Scripture. And in fact, there's good reason not to reject that. God, in fact, instituted science. There's nothing to fear from it. That's an ironic thing. You know, I've, I've run into Christians that it seemed like they think that science is it's kind of separation of church and science or something like that. Uh, God himself instituted science when he told us to have dominion over the earth and to subdue it, in Genesis 1.28. And then he made Adam a biologist by going and classifying uh, the animals. And in Job 38 through 40, uh, through, through 41 there, he, he gives Job not a, a Bible lesson, he gives him a science lesson. And we see Jesus all over the place pointing to the things in the earth for us to look at and learn things about the sparrows and so forth. God is not anti-science. The Bible is not anti-science. Uh, false science is certainly going to contradict the Bible. But true science will harmonize it with it perfectly every time. American physicist George Greenstein amazingly conceded. As we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency, or rather capital agency, must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit? Well, the answer is pretty obvious on that. Now, whether or not people will accept it, they never have. It's always been a remnant of people, always has. A very small remnant is the biblical terminology. We're talking eight people out of potentially 215 million at the time of Noah. Uh, we're, a few people have been with they, they <laughs> Why? Why is that the case? We'll talk about that in our next session, what is actually going on there. Dylan, when, when, do, you, when do you want to start the next one? We're technically not supposed to start until... Four, we want to do a full 30 minute, 35 minute break. How about we start at through? How about we just do 3:45? That's fine with me. Let's start 15 minutes early, unless, unless you're concerned about people online or something being able to start it at four, whatever you think. Okay, 345 it is.